have the feeling that the world is full of disasters, calamities, catastrophes. Well, so did our ancient ancestors. From wars to earthquakes, floods to famines, this series will reveal how scientists are now unearthing the evidence for cataclysmic events in the past and their disastrous consequences. Fabulous cities abandoned. The city dies. The people here meant to stay here forever, but something went wrong. Battlefields long forgotten. This onslaught of warriors hopping ashore and just causing mayhem and havoc. We don't have any other archaeological site where we see a conflict of this dimension in that period. Sophisticated civilizations toppled and lost to the mists of time. I think it's up there with the modern tsunamis you see here in the news today. To our ancient ancestors suffering these catastrophes, it must have seemed as though they were cursed. But science is now exploding those myths and rewriting history. In this episode, one of the most cursed periods in European history, the Middle Ages. They believed in God and devils and spirits and the dark and bad side of magic. War, disease, climatic disaster. With such calamities, Western civilization was on the verge of collapse. This is not a proper burial site. It is a site of a massacre, of a killing. So how did they survive? And how did these catastrophes lay the foundation for the modern world? In medieval England, religion was powerful, exercising control over people's lives and deaths. Funerary rites, the preparation of the body, the prayers, the burial itself, were seen as essential to ensure the soul of the departed would enter heaven. So, the discovery of a mass grave at Thornton Abbey in Lincolnshire was a real puzzle. What disaster could have overwhelmed the church so completely that it abandoned tradition and interred so many people together? The mass grave at Thornton Abbey is really unique. To find a mass grave in the countryside in a rural setting is really very rare. Dr Hugh Wilmot from the University of Sheffield is the archaeologist leading the excavation of this unusual site. The finding of this mass grave was a complete surprise. There was no indication that there were any burials here, let alone a mass grave. In fact, we were looking for something entirely different. We were looking for a building. Along with the first skeletons, the archaeologists found pottery fragments that dated the grave to the 14th century. It's actually surprisingly rare to find mass graves that date to the 14th century, especially when you think of how many people died. Um, you know, we have isolated examples primarily associated with towns such as London or Hereford, but this is the first one that's been found in a sort of rural community miles away from the local town. As more and more skeletons were uncovered, it became clear to the archaeologists that a terrible disaster must have claimed the lives of these people. They were in interlocking rows, so the heads of one row were between the legs of another row. And that tells you that these people were all buried at one time and in one go. Excavation of the neatly ordered lines revealed the complete remains of 48 people, as well as traces of a dozen more. But an initial analysis of the astonishing find only intensified the puzzle. 
We're in the grounds of a medieval abbey, so you might expect the people to be buried there to be sort of monks or canons of the abbey, so all male. But actually, we found we had a completely mixed population of males, females, and also a lot of children too. So it looked like a complete slice of normal society. Something had killed so many people so quickly that the normal process of preparing the dead for burial had been overwhelmed. When you find a mass grave, normally they will be dug as a response to a crisis. So we know that something is not working in the society. We really wanted to understand the context of why was it here. So when we started doing further ex exploratory work, looking at what was around the mass grave, we actually realised that there was a building. Careful study of this previously unknown building revealed it to be a hospital. Hospitals in the medieval period were not like hospitals today, where the, you go to get better. They were generally places you took the sick and the dying so that they could be cared for, perhaps when you couldn't care for them yourselves. So this made perfect sense for this to be the location of a mass grave. Burials next to a hospital are not unusual, but why were so many buried in one grave? What tragic event in the 14th century could have led to the sudden deaths of such a broad cross-section of society. We sent off samples of teeth from some of the burials to an ancient DNA lab in Canada at McMaster University where they specialise in extracting ancient DNA, and particularly ancient DNA of pathogens. What they found within the teeth was astounding. The first evidence from a mass grave outside a British city of Yersinia pestis, the pathogen that causes the Black Death. Modern pandemics like COVID-19 are devastating, but the Black Death was far more deadly. Arriving in the Crimea in 1347 aboard trading ships, it quickly spread across Europe, reaching England around June 1348. This terrifying disease caused blackening and swelling of the lymph nodes, usually at the neck, armpit and groin. The swellings were called buboes, giving the pandemic its name. Bubonic plague, the Black Death. Dr Piers Mitchell is a paleopathologist and director of the Ancient Parasites Lab at Cambridge. The Black Death is spread by a bacteria called Yersinia pestis. Now this is normally spread by the bite of little insects, such as rat fleas, or also been shown to be spread by human body lice. If you get a bite from a rat flea and the bacteria then injected into your body, then you tend to get a fever, you'll get pain and swelling in that arm, the bacteria will multiply and spread and go around the rest of the body, that's when septicemia happens, when the bacteria are multiplying in the blood, and that's when you're going to die soon from the plague. Like COVID-19, the Black Death spread quickly through dense urban areas, but its effects were even more devastating. It's believed that between a half and two-thirds of England's population died. And the mass grave for Black Death victims at Thornton, the first to be discovered outside a city, is changing the way archaeologists think about this catastrophe. I think it's pretty fair to say that sort of traditionally people thought that towns, urban centres were the most hard hit. But what this shows us is that it was equally devastating whether you lived in the countryside or lived in the town. The huge death toll of the Black Death ingrained itself in the psyche of the time and for centuries later. This was really a deeply traumatic event. This idea that death is present and that it becomes very much more apparent in the architecture and art of the church. So new forms of imagery becoming sort of popular, so images of skeletons and the dance of death. 
Black Death may be the greatest curse in human history, killing some 75 million people across Europe, Asia and North Africa. But further east, yet another disaster was looming. This one brought about entirely by humans. In the 13th century, Europe fell victim to a deadly curse, one that devastated farms and cities, laid low the rich and poor, killed millions. But this was no natural disaster. On the grassy southern plains of Hungary, between the Danube and the Tissa River, archaeologists have made a grisly discovery in the grounds of a 12th century church. It's a ditch which is filled with human body parts. They are not full skeletons. You see a skull here, a leg here, a hand here, all mixed up. But this is no church cemetery. This is not a proper burial site. It is a site of a massacre, of a killing. Archaeologist Jozef Lavlovsky is leading the investigation to find out who these people were and how they came to such a violent end. At a nearby monastery, further finds add to the mystery. This is a very colourful glass object. And it's not only amazing in its quality, it was restored from many, many fragments. And this object is one of the highest quality glass produced in the period. That's why the pieces still today are transparent, beautifully colorful. They were produced in Syria because at that time the center of glass production was that part of the Mediterranean. It is a unique piece and it is an unquestionable evidence for the importance of the site. Other discoveries include ornate religious objects, among them a reliquary and a once prized piece of intricate craftwork. These objects were made of antler, so kind of bone, and they were carved and then they were put on the cover of a medieval book. These symbols are biblical symbols. You also have got precious stones inserted in this carving. But why were such treasured possessions abandoned? It's very clear that they were not lost simply. They were there, they were found there, because the whole site was devastated. So who was responsible for devastating not just these settlements, but the whole region? The answer can be found in both contemporary written records and art. It was a Mongol invasion. Led by Bartu, the grandson of the infamous Genghis Khan, in 1241, these fierce horse-riding warriors swept into Hungary. They annihilated Hungary's royal army, leaving the population vulnerable. They heard about the terrible news, what happened in the neighboring areas, and they believed that they can defend themselves. They came to the best protected place around their church and they were building up a fortification ditch or actually three of them. 
And this is the place where they try to defend. But resisting the Mongols was futile. And what Jozef has discovered is shocking. No one was spared. The two skeletons, what you can see in right or front of me, they are small kids. They were not soldiers, they were not fighters. And we can clearly see that although their skeleton is not full, they are, these bones are in anatomical order. It shows that they fall down into this fortification ditch, or they were killed, or they were thrown into this one. You can see the body of this kid in this strange position. That's not a proper burial position. Jozef's ongoing work seems to confirm that this horrific picture was played out time and time again as the Mongols wreaked carnage across Hungary on an unprecedented scale. Really serious destruction. Whole areas emptied, whole areas devastated, people killed under very, very brutal conditions. And then, Suddenly, they disappeared. The reason why is still debated. Perhaps it was to crush a rebellion in newly conquered lands in southern Russia, or to return to Mongolia to contest the leadership of the Mongol Empire, or even because heavy rains in Hungary made it impossible for the Mongols to find adequate feed for their horses. Whatever the reason, Hungary and the rest of Europe were spared. And when the Mongols returned in 1285, the Hungarians were much better prepared. Castles had been built, and these new fortifications were instrumental in saving the kingdom from conquest. When forewarned, humanity can be adept at making preparations to stave off disaster. But for our ancestors, there were calamities in the face of which they were defenceless. Coming up, a disfiguring disease that blighted the medieval world. This is a skull of a young teenage girl. And what you see, the hard palate is totally destroyed. In the Middle Ages, the forces of nature and human conflict were turning the world of our ancestors upside down. Death was present. It was at the centre of life in a way that might seem shocking to us today. People were living with the threat of dying every day from wars, from famine, from pestilence. And now, groundbreaking new research is rewriting the history of one devastating disease. The town of Lund in southern Sweden. Beneath the surface, archaeologists have made a fascinating discovery. Dating back a thousand years to the Viking Age, the remains of a much older city with a terrible history. We are standing beside this very big stone church, and here is the part of the crypt, the oldest part of the church that was built around 1040, 1050. It's a very important building for Lund as a city. All people in Lund at that moment, were buried here. In this cemetery, there were at least 7,000 individuals buried. The skeletons were excavated and stored here in the warehouses of Lund University when Dr. Caroline Alström Arsini started to analyze this unique collection, she noticed peculiar changes in some of the bones. 
This is part of a skeleton from a man that lived in uh, around 1100. This man had had severe changes on his feet, so severe that they had to amputate his left foot. And the right foot is severely damaged, so bad that I don't think that he would be able to walk. This is a skull of a young teenage girl. And what you see, the, the hard palate is totally destroyed. You see there is a hole in the jaw. Caroline realized that these gruesome disfigurements were all signs of a terrifying curse of the ancients. Leprosy. Leprosy is a bacterial disease, and uh, it invades uh, the body, especially the skin and the nerves. Uh, and uh, it likes the cooler area of the body, like the face and the hands and the feet. The changes in the face often affects the nose and the upper part of the maxilla. So the nose sometimes become a big hole. Leprosy was thought of as a living death. So terrified were people of catching it that lepers were shunned. They were made to ring a bell so people could avoid them. I could imagine that it was a natural reaction that you didn't want to go near these people. You didn't want to have them in your house or in the streets. Caroline estimates that nearly a third of Lund's population was infected at the height of the leprosy epidemic in the 13th century. Intriguingly, there is no evidence of leprosy here prior to the 10th century. Now, new evidence from the church excavation is providing tantalizing clues as to how this terrible affliction arrived here. Experts have long thought it was brought to Scandinavia by crusaders returning from the Holy Land. But after studying the Lund skeletons, Caroline has a new theory. People that were buried near the church was not affected by leprosy. Uh, the leprosy cases we find in the outer part of the cemetery. We know that people that are buried near the church were wealthier, but the people uh, that were using the outer part of the cemetery were most probably poorer people, probably slaves. There were probably people coming from the Slavic area. The origin of leprosy is hotly debated but it's thought to have spread throughout medieval Europe following trade routes. Leprosy came to Scandinavia with a Viking trading, most probably with slaves that the Vikings brought here. Leprosy started already in the late Viking age. In Lund, it was already an epidemic. Dr. Alstrom Arsini's research reveals that leprosy was blighting Europe decades before the First Crusade, completely revising the history of this gruesome disease. Coming up, climate change devastates coastal villages. The water would have come so quick that it would have completely drowned the whole landscape over here. But transforms a small settlement into a prosperous city. In the 13th century, people living in the Netherlands may not have had to face the Mongol hordes, but they still faced a deadly threat, a force so powerful it could reshape a nation's landscape and change the course of history at the cost of thousands of lives. 
a threat we still grapple with today. The northeast coast of the Netherlands. When the fields here are ploughed, some mysterious objects appear on the surface. But for years, they've been dismissed as the accumulated rubbish from passing ships. But now, maritime archaeologist Dr. Iftinus van Popter is investigating. He wants to find out their true origin. The artefacts are cleaned up and stored at the nearby museum, Schokland. In front of me is a box with a lot of archaeological objects. First of all, a lot of animal bones that were found. This is, for example, from, uh, from cattle. Um, this is also one of a cow, which is called a vertebra, but also a lot of pottery. It's not a lot of material, but it tells us that people were living actually in the late Middle Ages on that spot. Until Iftinus's research, no one knew how inhabited this area was in the past. So we're looking at a map of about 900 AD of the region, and it shows us a lot about what the region must have looked like. So green on the map is the piece of land, and blue is obviously water. And as you can see, the region was not yet inhabited. No settlements were founded in the early Middle Ages. But as we take a closer look at the map of 1100 AD, we can see that people started living in the area. So the red dots on the map, they represent settlements that were founded in probably the 11th and 10th century AD. A picture emerged of medieval pioneers draining and cultivating this wet but fertile landscape. Imagine a series of small artificial mounds, these turfs on which the houses were standing, probably small wooden houses, uh, also likely connected with small dikes, and tiny communities of, let's say, 10, 20, maybe 30 people living there. But of course, uh, they were very busy people. They had to cultivate the lands, they had to keep them dry, build some coastal defenses, but also take care of their crops and their livestock. These people must have been used to living and dealing with water at close distance. So where did all the people go? When the area was first settled, there was a peat barrier protecting the land from the sea. But then the climate changed. Unlike today, when we're concerned about global warming and rising sea levels, back in the 13th century, it was global cooling that was the cause of disaster, ushering in a period of unprecedented severe weather. There was a massive storm front in the northern part of Europe that developed major waves. And as these waves traveled all the way towards the coast of the North Sea, by December the 14th in 1287, they hit the coast and they breached into the lands of Europe. And these lands were mainly belonging to what is nowadays known as the Netherlands and the northern part of Germany. The peat barrier that had protected the farmers and their land throughout decades of severe flooding was no match for what became known as St. Lucia's flood. The barrier was completely destroyed. The water would have come so quick that it would have completely drowned the whole landscape over here. So it's, it's very likely that they didn't have the time to pack their belongings and to take it with them to flee for higher ground. The people left behind their household waste, bones from food and broken bits of pot. But there are some more valuable objects here too. So I've got a plate over here. Um, that has been found in the Zuiderzee region, so the, the drowned lands of the Zuiderzee. This is a sort of luxury product. It's not the standard pottery that people were using in the area. Um, you can see the decorations, meaning that this plate could not only have been used for serving food on top of it, but also as a, as a decoration on the wall or somewhere else. So sudden was the flood that many people were unable to escape. It's thought 
that at least 50,000 people died. We presume that there must have been an enormous loss of life because these people couldn't go anywhere else. There wasn't that much land and they, of course, didn't have the big boats and other ways of transport to, to get away. So there was just no way to get out. The landscape was transformed. Where there were once farms and villages, there was now water, a corridor stretching inland from the sea. And the most important town that flourished from this corridor that was created was Amsterdam. So we could say that the St. Lucius flood is a disaster, but it also opened up new opportunities throughout the Middle Ages for, for the Netherlands to yeah, develop a real mar maritime uh, economy. And of course, we, uh, we prosper from it uh, even nowadays. St. Lucia's flood devastated the Netherlands, but in the end, it was also its making. Following the flood with its access to the sea, Amsterdam became one of the major trading hubs in the world, and the Dutch rose to become one of the greatest maritime powers. But another disaster was looming. In a century that saw plague, wars and famine caused by a global drop in temperature, people wanted an explanation. They wanted to know why they were being punished and who they could blame. Coming up, an epidemic of deadly superstition sweeps Europe. People living through the Middle Ages faced a precarious existence with death never far away and life expectancy cruelly short. After such a dark and turbulent time with war, famine and disease, a terrible and sinister new craze swept through Europe, pitting neighbour against neighbour and with especially dire consequences for women. Switzerland, the French-speaking Alpine region of Valais, home of the Matterhorn and Lake Geneva. And in the 15th century, the location of a diabolical event that tore the community apart and sparked three centuries of killings, resulting in over 50,000 deaths, most of them women. What could have caused such a catastrophe? In the 14th century, life across Europe took a turn for the worse. We're going into a little ice age of heavier rainfall, fiercer winds and worse winters, so people are more on the edge. Temperatures across Europe plummeted as much as two degrees Celsius. The Baltic Sea froze over and crops were blighted by never-ending rain. People's farms are pushed to the margin by the weather so a small amount of misfortune can ruin people in a way that it couldn't before. Was climate change the cause of the deadly event in Switzerland? Climate science didn't exist in the Middle Ages, but this terrible luck had to have a cause. But who or what was to blame? In the valleys of the Swiss Alps, villagers were desperate. It was as if their god had abandoned them. They're suffering an unusual amount of sickness among their children who are dying and among their animals and in their crops, and they feel cursed. With no understanding of the disease, people turned to superstition. Sanitary conditions and medical knowledge means that epidemics are rife. Knowledge of medicine is so low that most diseases can't be identified. They seem to come out of nowhere. A message brought to the region by preaching friars struck a nerve. It told of a new terror, a satanic crusade that used witches to harm people. The cursed villagers of the valley were quick to react. The local lords, the barons, decide to take up the cause and start hunting down these presumed witches. And because there's nobody to control or check these guys, the whole fear spreads very fast. 
People turned on their neighbors. Anyone who seemed suspect or untrustworthy was rounded up and put on trial. The people who were accused of witchcraft and the valet simply got everything that had gone wrong from local, for local people laid at their charge, uh, killing sheep in the shape of wolves, ruining the crops with storms, afflicting adults with illness and all manner of misfortune, but above all, and this is the big one, causing children to sicken and die so that they could then dig up their corpses and use their bodies in uh, evil magic and indeed eat them. The accusations seem so far-fetched to our modern ears, yet for these people, they were the most likely explanation for all their ills. Incredibly, the so-called crimes of the accused were recorded in detail by a local clerk of the court, Johannes Frund. The devil had promised to make them rich, powerful, and able to avenge themselves on enemies for denying Christianity. They made an annual homage to the devil, who usually appeared as a black animal, such as a bear or a ram, or a completely fabulous monster. He encouraged them to kill humans by poison or other means. He transported them by night from one mountain to another, and one village to another, by making them sit on a chair in which an ointment was spread. The guilty faced interrogation by torture. If they confessed, they were put to death. They weren't tortured by professionals. They were tortured by the local barons and their servants. So presumably they inflicted pain by whatever means came to mind uh, and did it so violently that many people died under torture. Those who remained silent fared no better. If they don't confess, they torture them to death and then convict them after their deaths and burn their dead bodies. So in the early hunts, there's no escape once you're accused. In a short space of time, over 200 people were executed in the biggest witch hunt since Roman times. People were not able to explain why there was a flash, for example, or why there was a flood, for example. And so they believed in, in God and devils and um, spirits and powers that you can't see. And in this magic world, there were good and bad spirits, and the dark and bad side of magic was also the witchcraft. During the height of witch hunting in Europe, women were most likely to be accused. Yet, in the Valet witch trial, two thirds of the accused were men. What was it that changed? In 1486, a book was written by Catholic clergyman Heinrich Kramer. Its Latin name is the Malleus Maleficarum, roughly translated as the Hammer of the Witches. Question 14, concerning the things that the judge has to consider before setting out the list of questions in the prison and torture chamber. It's step nine. What the judge must do is easy to explain. As common justice demands, the denounced woman is sentenced to the penalty of blood only if convinced by her own confession. The book was widely popular, a handbook for witch hunters. It standardized the treatment of suspect witches and outlined how they were to be interrogated. The most common torture instrument and device was a thumb screw. You would place the fingers between the metal plates and then screw it down. And while screwing down, this caused a very painful squeezing of the thumbs until blood comes between the nails and the nail bridge, which is very, very painful. If that didn't work, next came the rack. The wrists of the person being interrogated were fixed at the top, whilst their feet were bound in the bottom with a rope. The rope was raised around this wheel, and upon turning the wheel, the person would be stretched out. 
This led to a very painful dislocation of arms. And then came the worst of all, the excruciatingly painful dry hoist. The person being questioned, their arms were bound behind the back and then hoisted up on the hook you can see here. And this led to a very painful dislocation of arms. In very severe cases, one could intensify the pain by binding stone weights on the feet of the person to intensify the, the weight and therefore the pull. However much a person was able to bear these methods of torture, they were trapped. There could only be one outcome. If a person endured torture without confession, then it was with the help of the devil, and therefore this person was committed and sentenced to death, having a pact with the devil and being a witch. But of course, a confession wouldn't save the accused, but prove their guilt and end in the same way with a death sentence. And the hammer of the witches had another terrible legacy. Prior to the witch's hammer, almost every accused person accused of witchcraft was male or approximately 50 were male and 50% were female. After the witch's hammer, almost Every person accused of witchcraft was female, so the feminization of the crime of witchcraft, the focus on the female sex, was written down in this malicious book. Kramer's work redefined the witch as an evil woman and condemned thousands of them to death over three centuries. Incredibly, the witch-hunting frenzy, though it peaked in the 17th century, lasted well into the modern era. By the 1800s, though, people were accepting that killing so-called witches wasn't easing their ills and that there were, in fact, more rational explanations for their misfortunes. The cursed Middle Ages came to an end, an era of enduring famine, deadly epidemic, brutal wars and natural disasters that left their mark on the modern world. Up now, to celebrate a hundred years since the discovery of his tomb, we venture deep into the mysteries surrounding King Tut, allies and enemies. Or over on SBS World Movies, it's Resistance.